Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, this is an enthusiastic crowd. I like that for an early crowd. It's wonderful. All right. Well, good morning and welcome to our first ever back to school conference. For those of you that I don't already know, my name is Brianna Romines and I'm the president of the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan. I want to thank each and every one of you for being here today. This conference is made possible by the Michigan Pediatric Epilepsy Project and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services with funding from the Health Resources and Services Administration. That's a mouthful. Uh, well, because of this partnership, we've been able to plan a conference that we will hope that you will find incredibly informative and that will ultimately set up our students with epilepsy for success throughout the school year. So I would like to now turn the mic over and introduce you to our Director of Education, Russ Deary. He will be facilitating today's conference. Thank you, Russ. Thank you. Hey, welcome. It's uh, great to see everyone today. I, a lot of faces I recognize, but I would have to say actually more than I don't. So this is a lot of new people uh, introduced to the foundation today. So I'm really glad to see everyone here. Um, so we're going to get started with our first um, uh, presentation, which is on diagnosis and treatment of, of childhood epilepsy. And I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Alexandra Shaw. Do you want to come up, Dr. Shaw? And um, she comes via um, Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago, where she did her fellowship. She's actually originally from Michigan, so we're happy to see her come back. She's now the newest uh, pediatric epileptologist at Beaumont at their comprehensive epilepsy program. So um, we're going to start the program off uh, with just some a good overview of epilepsy diagnosis and treatment, which should provide a good foundation for the rest of the day. So. Welcome and thank you so much for, for being with us today. so much um, to the whole Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan, uh, specifically to um, Mr. Rusteri for giving me the opportunity to speak with you guys today. This is a, an honor and really a pleasure for me. Um, I'm originally a Michigan native who has been away for about half of my life now, if you can believe it, which gives you a sense of how old I am and maybe some of the things I've been doing since then. Um, but um, as Russ mentioned, um, I have recently uh, come from Chicago where I did my pediatric epilepsy and neurology fellowship training and where I was working as an attending at Lurie Children's Hospital. Um, I'm thrilled to be back in the area rejoining um, my family um, and to um, establish um, uh, professional work here. Um, the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan is of some personal importance to me um, as it was um, a critical resource for my own family um, when one of my brothers was diagnosed with epilepsy. Um, and so I'd like to you know, thank them again for their service and advocacy um, for my family and for so many children here in the state. Um, so I was given this uh, wonderful opportunity to review with you um, a huge, a huge portion of uh, material and territory, which is the diagnosis and treatment of childhood epilepsy which I hope um, an aerial view of which uh, won't be overwhelming as much as um, hopefully empowering in terms of giving you the information um, you might need to uh, take questions back to your providers to feel as though um, the correct uh, diagnosis and, and treatment is established um, for your uh, loved ones. Um, and, um, and yeah, so thank you so much for listening. So a couple of quick learning objectives. Um, I wanted to review with you today the difference between um, seizures and epilepsy, how to diagnose and classify epilepsy, some of the basics of epilepsy management, the medical, surgical, dietary, and uh, neurostimulation options that we have, um, epilepsy prognosis, some of the co-occurring developmental, cognitive, and academic, and mental health difficulties that uh, children and adults with epilepsy can experience, wanted to review when it might be appropriate to refer to a pediatric epileptologist, um, some basics about seizure detection devices, a little bit on transition from pediatric to adult care, and then a quick review of some resources um, online and in the community for you guys. So as you can see, a lot of information. Thanks for bearing with me. Um, so 
Um, I'm often asked um, in clinic um, or just out in the community, so who, who can have a seizure? Is it, is it just adults that can have seizures? Is it only individuals with developmental delay? Um, and in fact, the, the short answer is um, anybody can have a seizure. Anybody with a brain can have a seizure. So that includes all children at any age. And in fact, when we think about um, approaches to uh, diagnosis and treatment um, to seizures, um, children <clears throat> um, have very uh, unique um, aspects of, of those things, of diagnosis and care, and so we don't think about them merely as small adults. We think about them as um, their own you know, individuals at a specific uh, stage in their lives with specific needs. Just reviewing um, quickly seizures, the way I begin to break um, this down immediately is to try to understand, is a first seizure a provoked seizure or an unprovoked seizure? What I mean by a provoked seizure is also something that can be called an acute symptomatic seizure. What this refers to is a seizure that occurs within um, close temporal proximity to some acute stress on the brain. That stress can be a fever, uh, a head injury, such as a severe concussion, a bleed, a brain bleed, or a, um, a stroke, an infection, like a meningitis or encephalitis. It can be severe sleep deprivation, believe it or not. There's usually somebody actually in, in medical school who at some point, um, because of being awake for 48 hours or more, um, will have a seizure, and that's triggered by um, very poor sleep. Um, you can have uh, seizures in the setting of decreased um, oxygen delivery to the brain, which is what anoxic refers to. Um, metabolic stresses can be placed on the brain, such as changes in the sodium or glucose levels of the blood, or any um, metabolites that can be generated when uh, the kidneys or the liver um, are, are failing. There can be vascular stresses, again, such as a stroke or um, a blood clot in the, in the veins within the brain, which is a venous thrombosis. We can see some processes that occur actually after an infection and attack some of the white matter or myelin um, that uh, insulates neurons. Um, and then there are also um, toxic stresses, including alcohol withdrawal or, or certain drugs. Um, unprovoked seizures or spontaneous seizures can occur once, singly, or recurrently. And that's the situation um, that we begin to think about, this recurrent unprovoked seizure. Could somebody have epilepsy? So in terms of thinking about how, how common is epilepsy, um, we think about it in two ways, the incidence of epilepsy and the prevalence of epilepsy. I'm just reviewing those different concepts really quickly for you. The incidence of any disease um, is the likelihood that at any given time, uh, you might get it. So it's essentially, um, you can think of it as an age-related risk of acquiring something. And I'd like to show you, let's see the mouse uh, pops up here. So this is the, incidence curve for epilepsy. And what you can see is that the risk for epilepsy is much higher, actually, um, early on in life. It declines steadily through childhood, <coughs> reaches its um, nadir sort of in middle age, and then increases again um, towards, uh, towards older age. The prevalence of epilepsy, um, this is a slightly different type of number, refers to the overall sort of, you can think about it as a number of people in a community who have it, um, meaning it's sort of a cumulative um, number of diagnoses. Um, and that's this graph here. And, and it makes some sense to, to think about it that as time progresses, more and more people within, let's say, a, a given population will be diagnosed and will have it, and then it just continues um, as you get older. So thinking about um, taking all seizures uh, combined, whether they're provoked or unprovoked, about 4% of the population will have um, a seizure at some point in their life, which is actually pretty high if you think about it. Um, if you take out all of those seizures that are not caused by fever, about 2% of the population will have um, that. And epilepsy um, itself affects about 1% of the pediatric and adult population combined. Looking at pediatric epilepsy more specifically, the incidence, remember this is sort of the age-related risk of receiving a diagnosis of epilepsy or having seizures begin, is about half to 1%. So that sounds really low, but it turns out that that means that approximately one in 150 children is actually diagnosed with epilepsy during the first 10 years of their life. So when you think about it that way, it's actually not uncommon at all. And in fact, it's the most frequent chronic neurologic problem that children face. Again, the highest incidence occurring during infancy. So you might ask then, well, how do you diagnose epilepsy? 
Um, of course, um, diagnosis depends on how we, how we define it. Um, up until 2014, the working definition for epilepsy, as I had mentioned in the previous slide, was uh, two unprovoked seizures occurring more than 24 hours apart. So this could, this could mean that you might have a seizure um, on one day, and then two years later you had another unprovoked seizure. And that would mean that you had, epile had epilepsy, or you could have a seizure one day, and then another seizure uh, maybe two days from then, and that would suggest that you had epilepsy. Um, the reason why uh, the definition focused on two seizures was due to very good um, epidemiologic work that looked at the overall risk of having a future seizure, like a third or fourth or fifth seizure within the next five years. And um, uh, scientists just decided to, to sort of draw the line at where your recurrence risk, meaning the likelihood of your having another seizure, was about 60%, meaning high enough that it's actually pretty likely. And that was at two seizures. The new, there was a new definition that was uh, created by the International League Against Epilepsy in 2014 that continues to use the criteria, um, of, as I mentioned above, um, the, the original or old definition of epilepsy, but they realized that there were some circumstances in which we knew based on, um, after only one unprovoked seizure, if there were certain <clears throat> clinical features of, uh, you know, of somebody's life history or their physical exam or <clears throat> perhaps their EEG or something about their brain imaging that we knew it was so likely that they were going to have another seizure that we didn't have to wait and for them to have another unprovoked seizure before making a diagnosis. So this just allows us to even more um, confidently and quickly provide people with a diagnosis that we know um, they have. Um, the third category that, that was added in 2014 was something called an epilepsy syndrome. And I'm going to be describing some of these quickly for you um, in just a couple of slides. So hold on to that term. Um, in addition to thinking about when epilepsy starts, it's also helpful to think about, well, how do we know, how do we know if it's ever fully controlled or when is it resolved? This, um, as we know, can be um, a complicated uh, circumstance indeed to, to, to understand. Um, what the authors of this um, uh, report um, settled on was considering that it's resolved either in the setting of an age-dependent epilepsy, um, now after the age at risk, you can, the age at which you continue to be at risk for seizures, meaning you sort of outgrown them, or after you've had 10 years without any seizures, five of which you've spent off of anticonvulsants. So this is a very, very rigorous definition um, a very sort of tightly woven filter to apply to um, when seizures have ended. So just in, in quick review, under the new definition, having only one seizure, for instance, with either of these two findings would be considered epilepsy. Um, this is a, a, a slice of an MRI um, of, of a brain with um, a, a tumor in the right, um, sort of the right back corner, if you will, of the brain, it's right here. And this is that same person's EEG. Um, you can see that there is some slowing, which are these undulating waves here, and some spikes, these, these guys here, that look like almost like little cones, um, right in the same area where this, um, where this tumor exists. And so now um, we would have the confidence of saying, you know what, this person has epilepsy, and we would begin to treat them appropriately. So you might ask, well, can EEG alone diagnose epilepsy then? Could we use it as, as like a screening tool, for instance, to see is, is somebody at risk for getting it later in life? Um, and in fact, it's not quite that easy. This, for instance, is um, a normal EEG. Um, this is actually taken from um, somebody who I've seen recently here um, at Beaumont. Um, and this, it, uh, this is a normal EEG. This is, um, this is in the case of somebody who has epilepsy. And so this would not help us. This would be a false negative if we were just using this as a screening tool, for instance. So it doesn't tell the whole story. And you might wonder, how is that possible? How is it possible that we can take these EEGs? Sometimes they're really long. They're 24 hours. They're several days. How can we not see anything? And it relates to two things. If you think about the brain, um, I like to think of it almost as a walnut half. Um, if you can imagine the, the outer surface is kind of folded and it has lots of um, you know, surface convexities and irregularity, that's sort of the, that outer curve. And then there's all of the sort of meat, there's all of the tissue in the middle. And if the part of your brain that is generating seizures is deep within that, that um, inner part, um, the, the, um, 
the EEG isn't able to pick up necessarily any of the abnormalities on the on the skull surface because it's got to go through um, all of that brain tissue and then your skull and scalp as well. So just as an example, there are certain parts of the temporal lobe in particular, which is where these dots are, um, that uh, can technically generate seizures and don't don't generate um, scalp surface EEG abnormalities. As an example. Um, the same recording, actually, once we do a recording from the brain surface itself, um, readily picks up on um, the abnormal electrical signals that were coming from that area. Um, likewise, so this is a technically abnormal EEG. Um, you can see some spike wave discharges here in the left, central, and temporal areas. And you might say, oh, that person definitely has epilepsy. They have an abnormal EEG. And, and that's actually not the case either. This would be considered a, a false positive if you were using it as a screening test. It turns out um, about 3 to 4% of the um, population, um, children and adults, have technically abnormal EEGs, but they'll never have a seizure. It's just um, uh, you know, something that we consider sort of a genetic trait, essentially, that, that exists only on their EEG, and it doesn't mean that they'll ever have a clinical seizure. So we always have to be very you know, sort of aware of how we're using this a very powerful tool to make a diagnosis. There are, um, that said, certain EEG patterns that we know are, um, are highly, um, highly correlated with epilepsy. This being an example of one, this is um, something called hips arrhythmia, which is a very chaotic um, and abnormal EEG pattern that can be seen um, in the infant time period in the setting of infantile spasms. So um, I hope I've impressed upon you that making a diagnosis of epilepsy is about more than just an EEG, but requires a really good history, a good physical exam, and sometimes these um, ancillary um, diagnostic techniques. And you might ask, well, is a diagnosis of epilepsy enough? You know, you know that somebody with epilepsy has a recurring, a risk for recurring seizures. Maybe it's okay to end there. Um, but I'd like to, one of the things I'd like to impress upon you today is that this is only the beginning. This is the tip of the iceberg, as, as it were. Um, because epilepsy encompasses hundreds of subtypes, each of which has their own unique mechanism, has their own prognosis, and it has its own uh, treatment strategies. So finding, or at least trying to find with your, uh, with your provider, something that we call the etiology, this is a medical term, or the underlying cause of any epilepsy is essential. And it's essential because it allows the physician to refine their medical, um, potentially surgical, and other sorts of treatment approach. It allows us to better screen for comorbidities, meaning um, other difficulties with other organ systems that might occur in the setting of epilepsy. And it allows us to better understand the future for any child um, or adult with epilepsy. So then you might say, okay, well, what is epilepsy then? Um, this question relates intimately to how we classify or how we structure or order and talk about epilepsy as professionals. This is a, this is a pretty complicated subject and it's something actually that is the, a source of, of perennial debate among um, pediatric epileptologists and adult epileptologists, so I don't want to linger too much um, on this slide. Um, but I, I did want to identify that you'll recognize uh, maybe some of these terms in terms of um, how uh, we used to, as a community of professionals, talk about seizures. Words like partial or complex partial seizures, petit mal or grand mal seizures. It's interesting that the presence of French in a lot of um, neurology reminds us that so, many, um, so much of neurology was actually um, identified and sort of coined and disseminated from France, which is why there's so many French terms um, when it comes to seizures. Um, and so we would talk about epilepsy types with these terms, symptomatic or idiopathic, cryptogenic or unknown. And again, I don't want to linger too much on these, especially because um, actually just sort of hot off the presses in the, this spring in 2017, there was a completely new classification that was um, uh, not just proposed, but sort of decided upon and circulated again by the International League Against Epilepsy, which is the kind of global um, governing body of scientists and, and clinicians and professionals who think about epilepsy. Um, and they've made the following recommendations. Um, to discuss seizures um, using only three words, um, fo uh, thinking about where they begin or how they begin, um, focal, uh, meaning come from, coming from one uh, smaller population of neurons within the brain, or generalized, meaning starting roughly um, <clears throat> throughout the brain all at once in both hemispheres, left and right, or simply saying unknown. It's not clear whether it's a focal or a generalized seizure. 
And then from there, thinking about um, types of epilepsy. Um, epilepsy types that include focal seizures, generalized seizures, focal and generalized seizures, or again, saying unknown. One of the, um, one of the sort of revolutionary aspects, um, if I can use such a strong word about this new classification, is that it asks for, um, the treating physicians up front to think about the cause, the etiology. So this is something that um, is foregrounded now, um, which I think um, is very exciting and appropriate, again, knowing that um, everything flows from the cause, if you can identify it. Um, and in a quick review, um, the, the, the large categories of causes of epilepsy are structural, genetic, infectious, metabolic, autoimmune, or unknown. Just a couple examples of each of these. Again, these are, this is not a comprehensive list. This slide um, would not be large enough to contain a comprehensive list of, of these things, but quick examples um, include um, uh, of structural causes. These would be um, architectural changes in the brain that you are either born with or that you acquire later in life. This would include um, focal cortical dysplasias or malformations of cortical development, um, an ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke, um, hippocampal malrotation would be something that you are born with. Um, there are many, many genetic causes of epilepsy, some common examples being um, gene abnormalities in the TSC1 and 2 gene, which cause tuberous sclerosis, um, SCN1A gene abnormalities that cause Dravet syndrome, CDKL5, KCNQ2, GRIN2A, these could be relevant for, um, for people in this audience, potentially. Um, infectious causes of epilepsy could be viral or bacterial infections of the brain um, or meninges. Metabolic disorders refer specifically to difficulties breaking down one of the three uh, main fuel sources for the body. This is to say fat, protein, or glucose. Just a couple examples of these include urea cycle disorders, amino acidopathies, lysosomal storage disorders, the, the glucose transporter 1 deficiency, and mitochondrial disorders. Autoimmune epilepsies are caused by autoantibody mediated processes. You might be familiar with other um, autoimmune diseases like uh, lupus or Crohn's disease, for instance. Those are also antibody mediated processes. They're just targeting other organs. So Crohn's disease, for instance, um, targets the, uh, the large intestine. Um, lupus um, can affect many organ systems. It does also affect the blood vessels in the brain. Um, autoimmune um, epilepsies have antibodies that target um, cell neur neuronal proteins and parts of the brain um, and cause a lot of inflammation there. And then there's the unknown category, and, and, it, and it simply means that we don't know um, what the cause of an epilepsy might be. Um, and in fact, despite our best efforts diagnostically, uh, 15 to 25 percent of pediatric epilepsy cases um, have unknown causes. This is to say, after an extensive workup looking at all of those potential causes, we, we still say, you know what, we can't identify a causative factor here. And we know that over time, this territory um, of, of, um, of epilepsy types has been shrinking gradually, largely due to advances in genetic um, testing and genetic diagnoses. And it's um, sort of a general presumption that probably a lot more of children who uh, were in the unknown cause territory have a, have a genetic change that we just haven't, as scientists, um, been able to identify yet. Um, this slide is meant um, to highlight quickly the uh, website at the bottom more than anything. This is a, this is a quick review of the um, new classification of seizure types. The ILAE put together an outstanding website, which is this one, um, www.epilepsydiagnosis.org. I encourage you to visit this website for a glossary of terms, for outstanding definitions of seizure subtypes, of types of epilepsy, and also actually, and I think this is a, an amazing um, educational feature for videos of different types of seizures, so that you can actually, to better understand what they look like, um, go there uh, and look at, look at those video clips. So remember I mentioned um, the, uh, the epilepsy syndrome or the electroclinical epilepsy syndrome was one of the other uh, immediate time points when we can, as clinicians, diagnose somebody with epilepsy, even if we don't necessarily know um, the underlying cause. And, and this concept, it can be a little uh, tricky to get your head around, and um, I'm happy to answer questions about it at the end if you have any. If you have any. But um, moving quickly through this, um, the generation of epilep an epilepsy syndrome actually somewhat predates a lot of our diagnostic tools today, which is to say that 
um, the incredibly astute observers of yesteryear who say didn't have MRI scans or, or maybe didn't even have EEGs, but were just um, observing patients very, very carefully in their clinics, say in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, um, they were able to um, link together with extraordinary accuracy um, constellations of clinical features um, that often were associated with certain EEG um, or later um, brain imaging findings um, that allowed them to understand um, many things about epilepsy from the get-go. So let me explain what I mean quickly. So um, an electroclinical epilepsy syndrome refers to um, an entity that we can reliably identify because of a, a cluster of, of very consistent features. And by that I mean um, the age at which a seizure might begin, the types of seizures that somebody has, their developmental status before the seizures began, and if and how it might have changed after they began, aspects of their physical exam as well. Coupling that with features um, that we might see on their EEG and on brain imaging. And what's so powerful about this tool is that it allows us to quickly identify um, uh, an underlying a potential cause of epilepsy and to understand um, what treatment paradigms and prognoses flow from that. This again is something that allows us to refine um, our approach to medical and surgical treatment, to screen for co-occurring medical conditions, comorbidities, and again to provide better anticipatory guidance for the future. So just an example, as an example of what I mean by these electroclinical syndromes, these are actually terms that, that you probably recognize. Um, electroclinical syndromes are traditionally um, categorized by the age of seizure onset. So for instance, childhood absence epilepsy is one of these electroclinical syndromes. Juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, juvenile absence epilepsy, these are very common causes of epilepsy. Um, these are readily um, sort of diagnosable and identifiable uh, things for us. There are many others here which we don't have to get into. So I want to talk a little bit quickly about you know, the, some of the diagnostic tools that we have for epilepsy, um, understanding again that the diagnosis relies in part on evolution of and advancements in uh, technology. If anybody can name any of these cars uh, at the end, um, we'll get lots of credit. <laughs> Um, so uh, this is a, a quick review of um, the scalp EEG, which is really one of the mainstays of um, diagnosis for a pediatric epileptologist. Um, the EEG uh, was created in the 1920s. This is actually an example of one of those old machines. Um, they generated these really large paper printouts. <clears throat> they were essentially pen and ink, um, uh, you know, big pen and ink um, paper printouts, and that they were read almost like huge scrolls or manuscripts. They were this long and people just flipped through them. Uh, they weren't very long, of course, because it's so bulky and heavy to have that much paper, so they were maybe 15, 20 minutes. A far cry from the ethernet or wireless or portable um, EEGs that we have today that allow um, people like myself to read the studies um, uh, you know, remotely, either in another part of the hospital or even from home if there was an emergency in the hospital. Um, this is an example of something called a MEG scan, which is a magneto, magnetoencephalography, which looks at um, spike wave discharges. Don't want to get into the physics of this. It's a little complicated, um, even for me. Um, but essentially, it's, um, it's a way of identifying uh, where a spike source might be coming from within the brain and um, overlying that with, a, with an MRI picture so that we can actually look um, in this way to see where in the brain a spike might be coming from. Um, we're now, as you, as you may know, even doing intracranial EEGs, meaning not just scalp surface EEGs. Um, electrocorticography um, over here on the left refers to um, uh, an EEG that's done right on the surface of the brain, usually um, in preparation for an epilepsy surgery to um, even more, with even more exquisite sort of detail, identify where a seizure's coming from. Um, the sort of the most exciting new thing that's happened in the world of epilepsy surgery in the last uh, couple of years is something called stereo EEG, which refers to um, long and very narrow um, electrodes, almost like, like acupuncture needles, if you can imagine, that are uh, very carefully inserted um, deep into the brain to access some of those portions of the brain, as I mentioned earlier, that um, don't necessarily generate signals that we can record on the surface. It sounds scary. <laughs> Um, but it's actually quite safe. 
Um, and that's one way that's that's really revolutionized the way that we're able to um, identify very deep um, uh, epileptic foci or sources within the brain. Um, just quickly reviewing brain imaging. Um, this is an example of a CT scan, the old the old scan that gave us a pretty nice view of what was inside the skull. But as you can see, it's a little bit blurry. It's like looking at a TV maybe from the 60s. It's like you see something, but it's you know pretty granular. Um, this is an MRI scan of the brain. You can see the amount of detail and the resolution of the picture is just extraordinary. You can see so much of the architecture of the brain. This is still a mainstay of, of use and is only getting better with stronger magnets. Um, PET scan takes advantage of um, a glucose tracer that's injected through a peripheral vein um, that can help us identify areas where the brain isn't using um, fuel quite as avidly, which is an indirect way of looking for um, areas of difficulty. This can also be put on top of an MRI scanner, as you can see here, to help us understand where specifically areas of difficulty are. This is an example of a SPECT scan, which is another uh, radionucleotide tracer scan that can help us very successfully identify where a seizure is coming from. As an example, um, uh, without again sort of reviewing the uh, complexities of how to read these, I'll ask you to, to notice that here, this sort of green means not too much um, activity compared to other parts of the brain. Um, and this is what's going on uh, between seizures in this child's brain. But when we deliver this nucleo, uh, this, sorry, this uh, radionucleotide tracer during a seizure, uh, within the first 30 seconds, we're actually able to see that this spot lights up, which lets us know that, that the seizure is likely coming from that area. So this is a very powerful tool indeed. A functional MRI scan allows us to identify where speech, um, motor movement, and certain listening um, activities are happening in the brain. So we know to say avoid those areas if we're doing um, epilepsy surgery. The end result of, of um, all of these tests is something called co-registration, which means um, just sort of stacking all of these pieces of information, one on top of the next, um, and hopefully finding that there is some you know, concordance or agreement between all the data points in surgery to help us identify exactly where we should go to remove a part of the brain that might be generating seizures. And so um, what you can see, for instance, here is, this is information that we got on this patient from an EEG, meaning we knew that this part of the temporal lobe was, was generating um, seizures. And then we got information from a SPECT scan, that injection that I mentioned, to understand that we could refine it even more, that that area was, was uh, just this little red bit here. Um, and then we also were able to avoid um, the parts of the brain in this area that generated language because that's something that we wouldn't want to affect by any surgery. Um, and then essentially we're able to um, make a, a very um, tailored and, and small resection that removed um, this child's seizure focus without disturbing any local uh, language function. Um, so moving quickly now into laboratory testing, the most significant advances um, in lab testing have occurred largely within the realm of genetics. Just walking you through quickly, um, this is an old, this is a, an example of an old karyotype, um, which is something that let us look at, just at the chromosomes themselves. These guys, one, two, three, we've we've got um, uh, many of them, and uh, that sort of lets us gives us a kind of an over, overview, an aerial view of the, of the architecture of the, of the chromosomes. Um, we moved into single gene testing about 10 to 15 years ago that allowed us to identify a single gene within these chromosomes. Now we have gene panels that include anywhere from 40 to 200 of the most common causes, let's say of infantile onset epilepsy or later onset epilepsy. Um, one of the most exciting recent advances is in something called whole exome sequencing, which refers to um, reviewing the protein encoding or active parts of the, uh, of the genetic material that each one of us has. Um, whole genome, uh, meaning the entire, like every single piece of genetic information that we have, um, whole genome sequencing um, is still um, somewhat a, a thing of the future and we're still learning um, about its accuracy and its sensitivity as a test and that's something that people are probably going to be talking a lot more about in the next uh, couple of years. So let's that. Um, in terms of thinking about, um, now we're moving into the sort of aspects of treatment, medical treatment for epilepsy. Um, medication remains the mainstay of treatment of seizures for us um, in, in epilepsy. 
Um, our treatment goals are the same for everybody we see, and they sound more simple than, than they are, which are that um, we want kids to have no seizures and no side effects, ideally, from their medications. Um, again, it's, it's, um, that's our goal. We know that sometimes things can be more complicated than that. Um, in terms of how I or a colleague makes a, a selection for medications, um, first we identify what type of seizure somebody's having, whether it's focal or generalized or something called an epileptic spasm or an infantile spasm. Um, based on that seizure type, we then think about what sort of side effect profile does this medicine have? Um, for instance, um, some anti-seizure medications um, have effects on other organs like the liver, the kidney, the bone marrow. Um, they can cause um, many different things, um, fatigue, they can cause allergic rashes, or even sometimes behavior problems. And so we'll, we'll do our best to come up with um, a plan that sounds um, you know, most appropriate from a parent's point of view or a patient's point of view, and then from our point of view in terms of what are these side effects we might be willing to sort of you know, either, either risk or potentially tolerate. Um, sometimes we find that there are crossover effects for anti-seizure medications, by which I mean uh, that can be useful that we can harness in certain patient situations. So for instance, if somebody has headaches and seizures, we might think about using medications that can treat both. Um, Topiramate and Depakote or valproic acid are examples of those medications. Um, sometimes children have something called dystonia in addition to their seizures. Um, and we know that carbamazepine or Tegretol can be very effective in treating both, and so it might make sense to use that medicine first um, because we might be able to sort of hit two birds with one stone, um, if you will. Um, there are some medications with mood stabilization properties as well, Lamotrigine and again, valproic acid or Depakote are two of those medications. So those are some of the other ways in which we might refine our, our medication selection for a given patient. We also always think about any drug-drug interactions that we need to look out for. Um, it's important um, for me to remember, and of course, I'll make sure I'm, I'm accurately expressing to families that the medication that we have um, uh, provides symptom control, meaning we can suppress seizures with these medicines. We unfortunately, by and large, do not yet in epilepsy have medications that can modify the course of somebody's um, epilepsy completely. So for instance, in, in the world of cancer treatment, for instance, medicines like that are starting to be rolled out. And that's something that um, is a source of a lot of ongoing scientific, basic science uh, research. Um, I'll be going into a couple of examples of some of the kind of the early waves of disease modifying drugs in epilepsy, but unfortunately we right now are, are still in a realm in which we're, we're controlling symptoms of which are symptoms. This is just a slide that quickly and I think really nicely identifies um, the rapidity and rate of change in terms of drug development in the United States uh, and around the world. So the first anticonvulsant, um, bromide, you see here, you he believe it was actually identified um, just before the Civil War started in the United States. Um, and it took, um, it took almost another uh, 60 years before the second was identified, which is phenobarbital. Um, around World War I, and um, really since the, the 1990s, there's been kind of an explosion in drug development um, and uh, research. Focusing in on um, what's happened since 1998, you'll find um, you know, even a lot more. Even since this slide was created, there have been a couple of anticonvulsants that have come to the market since then. So again, just a quick review and table, and I won't go through each one of these, but we can talk about any of them at the end if it'll be helpful. Um, when we think about um, identifying medications to um, treat seizures, we break them up into medications that can treat focal seizures or generalized seizures um, or spasms. Interestingly, um, infantile or epileptic spasms we know do not respond to traditional anticonvulsants. Um, which is why we rely on steroids or hormonal therapy, uh, mainly for those seizures. That includes things like ACTH, which is an, um, an intramuscular, um, very strong hormone, prednisone or prednisolone. But gabapentin, which is a, a more traditional anticonvulsant, however, um, is sort of a standalone in terms of its utility for infantile spasms, and most specifically in the setting of tuberous sclerosis. So in terms of thinking again about disease modification, um, so 
Um, as opposed to merely symptom control, of course, ultimately, our goal um, as providers is to um, see if we can develop um, uh, medications that not just control seizures, but maybe actually modify the course in the future of somebody's epilepsy, by which I mean making it less likely that they're going to have seizures at all. Um, or even, you know, if, if you can imagine this, um, preventing them from having seizures in the first place, if we can make a diagnosis of what the underlying cause might be. Um, the kind of the, the lead or the, the heralding um, experiences that we've had in the world of epilepsy with um, anti-epileptogenic medication comes from um, the world of tuberous sclerosis. Um, uh, in that um, illness, um, children can be more likely to have certain types of tumors in their brain called subependymal um, giant cell astrocytomas or tumors in their kidneys. And so um, a group of researchers, specifically out of Cincinnati Children's, in treating, um, in trying to treat or suppress the growth of these tumors, um, we're using medications called Everolimus and Serolimus. And they found, and, and these are medications that work on a pathway called mTOR, um, which is the mammalian target of rapamycin. It's a cell signaling pathway. Um, they found that as they were treating children both with uh, and without seizures who had tuberous sclerosis, they were not only able in some children to control the growth of their tumors, but they reduced the number of seizures they were having in some, and actually in a few others who didn't have seizures yet, seemed to postpone the age at which seizures began to occur. So of course that was really, really exciting. Um, understanding that these are medications that are not just acting to suppress seizures, but make it less likely for kids to ever have seizures at all, which is really, really exciting. Um, there's even a little bit of preliminary um, lab data to suggest that there could be other types of epilepsy in which the mTOR inhibitors could be useful. Um, I want to stress that this is very preliminary indeed, but nevertheless the source of a lot of really exciting conversations at a basic science level. Um, there are lots of unknowns right now about how to use mTOR inhibitors safely and effectively, specifically with regards to the timing, what meaning when to start the therapy, or the duration of the therapy, meaning how long it should be extended. Because technically these are immunosuppressants, um, although they're generally very well tolerated, you have to be very uh, careful um, in terms of thinking about some of these immune system being a little less active than usual, meaning they're a little bit more likely to have um, infections, um, they can have elevated blood um, lipid or, or fat content, lower blood platelets, and, and, and ulcerations in the mouth. So we're trying to figure out how to use these safely and effectively and to see ultimately whether or not we can expand their use in other types of epilepsy. So I think this is really exciting. Looking even further into the future is this, this concept of precision medicine, which is something that you guys may have sort of read about online or is a term that might be circulating within um, you know, your community of, of friends or, or your professional group. What this refers to using the, the National Institute of Health's um, uh, definition is it's an emerging approach for disease treatment and prevention that takes into account individual variability in genes, the environment, and the lifestyle of a given person. Uh, and what that means specifically is that it would allow doctors and researchers to predict even more accurately, accurately which treatment and which prevention strategies for a very particular disease would work in a person or a group of people. Some examples of precision medicine that you kind of don't even realize are already out there are things like, like what I'm wearing, like for glasses. So if you need glasses, you're not just given a pair of glasses. You get, you get it customized for the type of vision deficit that you might have. Or if you have an allergy, for instance, um, you get tested to understand exactly what type of um, substance you're allergic to. If you need a blood transfusion, it has to match your blood type specifically. Um, and so, you know, ideally, um, we would love as a community of, of scientists and clinicians to move towards a future in which we could be able to use um, information about somebody's genetic um, uh, makeup uh, to help tailor um, what sort of medications might be the most effective for them, and even what might cause the fewest side effects. Unfortunately, right now, today, we're still pretty far away from being able to do such precise, um, sort of finessed tailoring, but this is, um, this is uh, also something that's very much in the pipeline and is, and is the subject of, of lots and lots of talk at the, at the conferences, for instance, that I attend throughout the year and throughout um, scientific communities around the world, actually. So I'm gonna, just for the sake of time, kind of skip through this, but just focus on the um, kind of the headline, which is 
um, when to ask or think about surgery? Well, technically at any time, but specifically if medications aren't working. Always ask, could my child be a surgical candidate? Um, the reason is the rationale for early epilepsy surgery, which of course is um, a daunting thing to think about um, from every perspective, you know, from the standpoint of a, of a provider and, and certainly even more so from the standpoint of family or, or a patient. Um, nevertheless, we have um, very good and, and increasing um, data to suggest that if it's a clinically appropriate, the earlier we can do surgery, the, the better the outcomes, both in terms of seizure control and ultimately development. Um, but there's information that we have data to suggest that we can do a better job of reducing seizure frequency overall in the future with early surgery. We have lower rates of subsequent developmental and behavior difficulties. There's less co-occurring medical problems and even mortality due to seizures. We can stabilize a child's developmental trajectory or even increase their developmental potential by stopping seizures early. Um, specifically, this is becoming um, of interest in the realm of infantile, uh, infantile spasms that are due to structural or architectural changes in the brain. And surgeons have become even more um, equipped to try to, to, to correct those difficulties if we can. Um, children overall have lower complication rates than adults in surgery. Their brains are much more plastic and malleable, meaning they recover much more effectively and completely from surgery than adult brains do. So, you know, if I, for instance, got whacked in the head with a baseball bat um, today, um, I wouldn't really be able to reorganize any of the function of my language or motor movement. I would just have a, a deficit. But um, if a child, let's say, has an injury that, you know, or has, a, has something about their brain that, that they've always had, that they were born with, or if they have an injury that they incur early on, um, it's, what's amazing is that they're actually able to shift the function of language or even motor movement that may, say, reside on one side of the brain and move it all the way over into the other, um, which is extraordinary indeed. And so um, they recover much better from surgeries. Um, in terms of dietary therapies, um, these are fascinating. These are actually an area of specific interest of mine. Um, the, the principles of, of dietary, diet eating modification um, date back, if you can believe it, to the Old Testament and the Bible and actually ancient Greece. So um, there's an ancient Greek um, uh, aristocrat and physician um, named um, Erasistratus who described in his writings that one inclined to epilepsy should be made to fast without mercy and be put on short rations. We're not quite as severe now, but what's extraordinary is that this basic principle um, is the same now as it was then. Um, the ketogenic diet, which is um, the most sort of widely used and most restrictive um, dietary therapy, was identified and used for the first time in 1921 by Dr. Russell Wilder um, at the Mayo Clinic. Um, I just wanted to review quickly that there are three major or sort of main um, dietary modifications um, that we can recommend to uh, children and adults with epilepsy. Um, the ketogenic diet being the most restrictive, but also the most commonly used. Um, it is a high fat, low carbohydrate, and adequate protein diet, typically um, that has a ratio of three to four grams of fat per gram of carbohydrate. To give you an example of what this ends up looking like on a plate, and it might sound dramatic, but amazingly kids can do very well with these diet changes if they're, if they're made earlier in life, is that that only amounts to having a couple of grams of carbohydrate a day, which, which is less than what you get in a slice of bread. So um, there's a lot of education um, that we do with families and with patients um, who might be starting the ketogenic diet. Again, um, um, you know, it's, it's not something for everybody. In fact, usually the younger you are, the easier it is to, to use this diet. Um, but it has some profoundly helpful um, effects specifically in, in epilepsy syndromes that I'll identify um, below. Um, the modified Atkins diet um, is a little bit less restrictive. You can have up to around 10 grams of carbohydrates a day, and there's no limits on um, cal overall calories or protein. The low glycemic index treatment diet is the least restrictive. You have about 40 to, 40 to 60 grams of carb carbohydrates per day, and it's actually pretty close to what you know the overall sort of recommended you know, glycemic load for any adult um, is, it's just a little bit shifted down from that. Um, what's interesting is that many of these diets are being investigated for um, illnesses outside of epilepsy and, and cancer and dementia. 
um, and actually in, in endocrine um, illnesses like diabetes um, with a lot of really promising results there too. Um, we see that in epilepsy, they're particularly helpful in the setting of infantile spasms or epileptic spasms. In something called the glucose transporter 1 deficiency, um, pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency, Dravet syndrome, myoclonic astatic epilepsy, and many other refractory epilepsies. For some children and families, um, one of the main, uh, main appealing aspects of these diets are their more favorable side effect profile compared to some of the traditional anticonvulsants. By which I mean, um, they don't have effects on some of the other organ systems that medications can, on, on the liver, again, the kidneys, the bone marrow. Um, it doesn't tend to cause um, fatigue or um, headache or some of the other more concerning sort of constitutional changes that we can see with um, medications. So um, they're certainly, potentially in the right circumstance, a very um, exciting um, potential therapy. Um, I wanted to very quickly, because my understanding is that this was a specific, of specific interest to some people in the crowd today, is talk about um, epilepsy prognosis and whether or not children can outgrow their seizures or epilepsy. I think this is a really important question. It's certainly the question um, that follows immediately after being diagnosed with epilepsy is what is the future going to look like? And um, uh, really, it depends completely on the underlying cause or the etiology, meaning um, going back to some of those earlier slides and all of those different things that can cause epilepsy, each one of those has a very different and unique prognosis, one to the next. And so to be able to answer what is the future going to look like, we've got to be able to answer what's causing the seizures in the first place, what's causing the epilepsy. So um, sort of from an aerial view, we know that any reflex or triggered seizures um, or acute symptomatic seizures, meaning that list of things that I, that I reviewed at the very beginning, um, those are things that we know that, that children um, by and large grow out of as long as their, their brain hasn't sustained any, any enduring injury from that experience. We know that some of the genetic generalized or benign childhood focal epilepsies, some of those electroclinical epilepsy syndromes that I mentioned, like the absence epilepsies or juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, it's very possible that you can grow out of those. Um, Symptomatic epilepsy, and I realize this is one of the terms that I said was an older term for epilepsy, but what this means specifically is epilepsy ref um, that's a result of a known um, fist, uh, fixed um, architectural change or, or some other um, metabolic or genetic or autoimmune or infectious process, meaning a, a, there's a, a fixed lifetime risk for seizures. It's less likely that somebody will be able to grow out of their seizures in, the, in those circumstances. And then again, if the cause is unknown, then it's, it's very difficult to predict because we don't know what entity we're necessarily specifically dealing with. I just thought it would be helpful to break down, um, roughly speaking, from a treatment response standpoint, we have very good information um, from larger um, epidemiologic um, data sets that, that help us understand how things break down. Um, when somebody is newly diagnosed with epilepsy, again, we try to understand do they have an electroclinical syndrome or not? And then um, uh, after that decision, we understand that there, there are a couple of different um, potential outcomes. Self-limited um, epilepsies refer to age, um, an age-related vulnerability to seizures, um, meaning something like benign Rolandic epilepsy, um, uh, which is something that we know that, you know, the vast majority of children grow out of and seizures happen infrequently and we often don't even treat with medications um, because we know that the epilepsy won't get too complicated and seizures don't happen too frequently. Pharmacosensitive epilepsy refers to epilepsies, um, the seizures of which respond um, quickly to medication and that they may ultimately remit. These are epilepsies like childhood absence epilepsy um, um, is a very good example of one of those. A pharmacodependent epilepsy, 20% of epilepsies fall into this category. This refers to epilepsies in which the seizures respond well to, to medications, but the likelihood of being able to stop using medications over the course of one's life is a lot lower. So this would refer to, um, let's say, maybe seizures that are coming from, again, those symptomatic or epilepsies or epilepsies that are being generated by some fixed and lifelong risk for epilepsy. Um, we know too that approximately 13 to 17 percent of epilepsies unfortunately fall into the category of pharmacoresistant or intractable, meaning that 
despite um, well-selected medications, seizures persist um, and, and uh, likely will over the course of a child or adult's lifetime. We know that within this category, about 30% of children and adults at some point in their lives will experience a, even over 12 months of seizure freedom, but within, um, within that group of, of people, 70% um, will ultimately have seizure recurrence. So this is the um, this is one of the areas of, of um, very close focus for um, you know scientists and clinicians in terms of understanding how to better how to better support these children as best we can. So an important question to ask is do you do you know what intractable epilepsy is? And um, what it refers to is having persistent seizures after two appropriately selected medications at doses that should work for somebody's weight. There's no consensus about how frequently seizures need to occur in this setting, meaning you know, it's a little bit more obvious to understand that if you have one seizure every month um, on two medications, or after having tried a third, you, you have intractable epilepsy, but, but what if you have only one a year? That sounds pretty good, but technically you still have intractable epilepsy. Um, one of the, the questions that I understand was, was posed um, for me to help understand is are there any risk factors for intractable epilepsy? And, and yes, there, there are. There are some well-defined risk factors that we have from good clinical, um, um, cl clinical research uh, studies. We know that um, having many seizures prior to starting medical therapy, meaning starting medications, um, puts you at risk for having intractable epilepsy. That means that there's a delay to the diagnosis of having seizures or a delay to starting medications. Um, it makes seizures more likely to persist. We know that um, the response to the first appropriately selected medication um, can, be, can be predictive in terms of what um, somebody's overall course will look like in the future. Um, we know that having, again, this term symptomatic epilepsy um, a fixed, enduring, structural, or genetic, or metabolic, mitochondrial, infectious, or autoimmune cause of epilepsy, um, again, will make intractable epilepsy more likely. We know that having uh, focal slowing on your EEG can also increase the risk of intractable epilepsy and having a history of uh, seizures, seizures in the neonatal time period. So I think this um, is, is uh, the appropriate time then to ask, well, why refer to a pediatric epileptologist specifically? Um, we know that um, pediatricians and pediatric neurologists can do an excellent job of taking care of seizures, but um, when is it time to ask um, when to refer, particularly how do you know when things are getting complicated? Um, and some of the things that I like to think about and, and review with families are to, and are to remind them that the longer seizures persist, again, untreated or on medication, the harder of full control can become. Um, and that uh, we know that ongoing seizures can impact learning and development for children. Um, it's appropriate to refer when you don't have an etiologically specific diagnosis, meaning um, somebody's only been able to tell you your child has seizures and that's it, or a seizure disorder and that's it. Um, referring to a pediatric epileptologist um, increases the treatment options that you have um, and facilitates um, maybe, you know, um, maybe uh, even better treatment options. We know that um, using the wrong medication in certain circumstances can make some types of epilepsy worse and much harder to control. We know that, again, the chances of seizure freedom decline after the first two medications are used. We know that um, Frequent or recurring episodes of status epilepticus can um, cause injury um, and uh, are, and confer a risk of mortality. So we like to control those. Um, we know that there are options even beyond traditional anticonvulsants, medically, surgically, with dietary and neurostimulation. And we know that there's more than just seizures going on. We know that there's effects on there can be effects on development, learning, mood, behavior of a child's social circumstances and, and their larger family as well. And so we're primed to help out with that. Um, so when to refer, anytime, absolutely anytime, we're here to help. When the first medication hasn't worked, refer. When you don't know which medication to choose, if you're a provider, I'm not sure if there are any here today, refer. If you can't readily identify an epilepsy cause or diagnose more than just seizures, please refer to a pediatric epileptologist. When you identify an etiology that's highly associated with intractable epilepsy, please refer. When there's a structural brain lesion or when surgery might be a possibility, refer. When there's multiple other health issues, probably um, that's an indication that things are a little bit more complicated and an epileptologist might be able to help 
more specifically, and again, just at any time. We, we would love to see anybody in the clinic. Um, so who's on, on my team and, and your team, if you if you care to come visit us um, at, at Beaumont, we have neurologists, epileptologists, advanced practice providers, nurses, I won't read this whole list. We have a multi multidisciplinary and a comprehensive group of people on our team. We also work with many other um, subspecialists throughout the hospital that help us with diagnosis, with management, um, and with longer term uh, rehab and treatment. Um, some other considerations really quickly, uh, knowing that seizures um, are just, just one of many, many um, aspects to consider for uh, children and adults with epilepsy. We know um, that it's very important to screen for and think about any developmental um, difficulties that might have predated or started after um, seizure onset. We know that referring to early on a developmental pediatrician or physical, occupational, and speech therapists um, can be very, or are, is critical um, to identify and help um, support any speech and language gross or fine motor uh, difficulties that somebody's happening, having. Excuse me. Um, identifying cognitive or academic difficulties is also very important, knowing that children with epilepsy are more likely before their seizures begin even and after they start to have these difficulties. I encourage you, um, thinking about the school year, and I imagine somebody is going to mention these um, today, um, ask about an individualized individualized education plan if your child doesn't have one, even if it's overkill, say, just ask about it. See if that's something that um, a school thinks might be helpful. Um, it's something that, that a child can be um, uh, can receive if they're over three, <clears throat> and again, it's something that can be created for a parent on request. Um, a 504 plan is also something to think about. It's a medical plan for anybody um, who attends a school with any medical problem at all. It can be for headaches, um, migraines, for stomach problems, and also for seizures. This is just a medical plan that specifically pertains to your child to keep them safe at school. Um, <clears throat> more referrals can be made to a neuropsychologist or a pediatric psychiatrist to help with those <coughs> questions or with any mental health or mood uh, difficulties. We know that those are more common as well. I'll let you guys read through these. Um, I realize there's so much. Um, I'm, I'm being cued to sort of wind down. There's so much to talk about with epilepsy. Um, I feel very passionate about talking about even more than seizures. And so in some ways, we're getting just into the meat of what matters to me a great deal as a sister, um, as a, you know, as a, um, and as a physician. So if you guys have any questions about these um, seizure alert devices, um, <clears throat> transitioning to adult care, and I'm going to leave these resources up while we're speaking just so you can write them down. Don't hesitate to ask. Thank you so much for your attention. I realize this is a long talk, and it's early. Thank you. Okay. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much for being here today and for everything that we've learned from you. We're now going to open it up for question and answer, so to keep it as I think as organized as possible, this is going to be the main microphone, so if you'd like to answer, ask a question, if you could line up here, and we will start Q&A. Okay. Any question is, is fair game. I'd really love to be as helpful as I can be, particularly, again, with some of the slides um, that we didn't get to if anybody has any questions about um, these other considerations, about seizure alert devices, um, about transitions, uh, and about anything else. Please don't hesitate to ask. So is that like normal or can you help me with that? Yeah. Give me something else. 
Those are both very good questions. So in terms of thinking about um, you know, autoimmune processes, understanding that, that they can be more common running within certain families, um, affecting different organ systems, it's definitely something that as I'm taking a family history or as a physician is taking a, a family history, um, we, we always inquire about autoimmune autoimmunity in families because um, it's just sort of a, a little um, signal and sort of in the back of our brains to think, oh, could this be relevant at some point in the conversation about seizures? And, um, you know, it can, um, um, you've given an excellent sort of summary and overview without knowing um, the specifics about, um, about um, your daughter's health condition. It's hard to make more specific sort of recommendations, but, um, you know, we do know that um, even in, in family, even in families in which um, autoimmune conditions are more prevalent, meaning, again, just as you say, um, many families have a lot of autoimmune bowel diseases, um, for instance, um, autoimmune epilepsies um, have a very specific way of um, beginning. Um, and they are um, sort of, again, constellations of, of changes in a child which um, are um, uh, clue us, um, clue providers quickly into thinking, could this be an autoimmune process? And what I mean is um, they often start very quickly and escalate very, very dramatically. And so children with new autoimmune epilepsies often um, within a week or two will be in the hospital or even in the ICU um, because of their seizures because they're happening so frequently, like so many in a day and they're just getting worse and worse. And, and they're often associated with other changes, as I mentioned, um, in the way a child is thinking or walking or sleeping or um, movement disorders. There's a, there's a constellation of things that you can see and um, you know, so we kind of know it's not just the family history that makes us worried. It's these more specific things, also specific things on the EG. So, um, you know, so I'm not sure if that's too helpful, but, um, but it is good to know that, you know, it is always helpful to think, okay, there's this thing that runs in our family. Does it relate to my child's epilepsy? Absolutely. Um, and then in terms of your question about um, how to safely um, discontinue medication, gosh, that is one of the that is one of the hardest decisions to make, isn't it? It's um, it's something that we have, you know, some um, good clinical data to, to guide our our efforts. Um, just reviewing um, some things that we did here in terms of um, trying to think about uh, somebody's overall um, prognosis, thinking about those categories of pharmacosensitive or pharmacodependent or pharmacoresistant epilepsies. When we're moving into a situation in terms of thinking about um, stopping medicines, it's always helpful to think back, well, where do they, where does this person fall within these epilepsies? And that already tells us in some ways what their risk of having seizures come back is. Um, and that, of course, is related to the underlying cause, which is why if we can identify that, it's so helpful and so important. Um, whether or not or how to use an EEG to help guide these treatment decisions is, is thorny indeed, and it's something that um, there is not a consensus among um, epileptologists in terms of how to use any EEG data that you might get before um, leading seizures. And so there's really so much to think about, just as you say. Um, and, I'm, and I'm sorry that things um, didn't go quite as you, as you had hoped. Um, and certainly that, you know, catamenial stress can be difficult for some young women with epilepsy. So um, I, hope, I hope that clarifies um, some things. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I just have a quick question as far as going down the road of how uh, devices work for the uh, seizures and how they're developing in Sure. Can you, can you repeat that one phrase you used for the seizure type? Yeah, okay. well, I think, you know, that's a new term for me. Um, uh, what, is, um, what is a tectonic? Basically, it's a uh, very convulsive. It's very steadily got it. movable. Yeah, I got you. That's, that's what the U of M is calling it. Got it. Yeah, no, that's, um, um, uh, I wonder if it's atonic. Um, Thank you. Okay. No, 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 that's all right. There's so many, so many, um, that's why this glossary that I was referring to on the website is so helpful. There's so many words. It's like having to learn all the words that you might need to be like a car mechanic, right? You just have no idea what any of this stuff means. Um, so that's a really, really important point. So traditionally, um, the ways in which these seizure detection devices work is by, um, by identifying oscillatory or rhythmic or clonic jerking movements in, in a limb, an arm or a leg. And you, you've hit exactly on where the, the kind of the, you know, the, not the weak point, but just where these devices, the limitation of these devices is that 
Um, if, um, if some of these seizures do not generate um, either a large amplitude movement or clonic movement, many seizures, just as you say, aren't associated with any movement at all. Um, these devices are much less useful. Um, so um, there's knowing that um, there are some companies that are thinking about other sort of they're called biometric data, meaning heart rate changes. There's something called um, a galvanic skin response, which refers to the way the sort of electrical, believe it or not, we all have these electrical sort of currents that exist on our skin at any at every given moment, and they change based on heart rate and other um, autonomic sort of dynamic features. They're trying to understand um, whether or not we can harness that information to identify seizures. There's actually um, an open clinical trial right now um, for something called the um, MFIT, uh, the watch, um, I can pull this up. Yeah, I'm sorry, the Embrace watch. Um, they have an open clinical trial right now. If you Google Embrace clinical trial, you can find some information if you wanted to say participate in that. But that's definitely one of the limitations. The other um, is that um, a lot of these devices were tested in, in hospital epilepsy monitoring units, meaning there's a backup identification possible. They haven't been tested as thoroughly in homes, and that's part of the reason why um, um, they haven't been approved, say, by the FDA. Yeah, but great question. you're having the, the courage to, to stand up and, and ask that question and, and welcome um, to this meeting. As I understand, this is your first uh, time gathering at the Epilepsy Foundation. Um, I can sense that this is a really complicated um, question indeed and, and certainly um, a pressing one. And I would love to talk to you a little bit more about it, if I may. Um, we can just talk one-on-one. -on -one. It sounds like there's some really um, nuanced information to review. Would that be okay? Um, well, some of the things that I think about just in generally when I when I fit when I and, and this is not you know believe it or not a, a non-common situation to be in um, uh, children um, it can be hard to diagnose seizures and it can be hard to diagnose events that are specifically caused by epilepsy and um, you know I know that the experience of um, diagnostic testing over the course of, of years can, is harrowing and, and stressful and very anxiety provoking um, and um, we wish that it weren't the case sometimes that it took so long to understand what was going on for a given child. Sometimes it does. Um, but there are there are things that I can think about that I'd love to, to speak to you specifically about just after this particular Q&A, if that's all right. Just because it's such a specific question to you, if that's okay. Okay, and we also are we're running short on time and I want to be able to, to answer. Okay. Oh, I have a teenager. Yeah. Her epilepsy is generated 
from her seat at night time she has a hard time doing it. So I've been listening to this podcast of my health show and they recommend melatonin as a resource of mm-hmm. health and her Do you recommend that and if you don't? Yeah. It's a great question. Sleep, um, sleep can be so complicated for children with epilepsy um, for many reasons. Um, and for adolescents in general, falling asleep now, especially when children are so plugged into electronic devices, we know that this is having an impact on sleep cycles. Um, melatonin is a very safe um, um, and really the most widely used compound to try to help with sleep initiation. Um, it's something that we usually give about an hour before we want somebody to fall asleep. Um, you can start. Um, you know, the, this is an over-the-counter medicine. Um, you can start it safely at home. Um, you can also start it up through your provider. But yes, I, I use that um, with some regularity in my practice as well. Yeah, good question. Yep. Yeah, okay. One is, if someone's on Capra or Tilanapin, sorry, Capra or Tilanapin, what are the possible side effects? I know that you said blood and liver problems, but specifically what time? Yeah, that's a great question too. So. So, you know, um, I don't know if you've ever opened up a package insert for something like Tylenol or Advil, like open up one of those things that's folded up into, into size like that, and you open up and goes, whoa, there's so much little text on this. And, and I usually just throw those away, like so many people do for Tylenol. Um, but we, what you realize is that um, when, someone, when the medication is FDA approved, um, they have to, by law, list every single possible thing that could occur and every single thing that anybody who tried the medication in a, in a clinical trial experienced. Um, And so we find, while that's a comprehensive list, um, it's not terribly helpful because it just sort of lists every possible symptom that you could have. What what we rely on are sort of the common core of symptoms um, or side effects that um, are more likely to be um, uh, described to their provider um, who are are treating. And um, for Keppra, um, that um, list of side effects is actually um, much smaller than many of the other um, anticonvulsants, which is the reason actually why it's the most commonly used anticonvulsant in the United States and around the world. Um, it does not have any effect on other organ systems the way that some other anticonvulsants do, meaning it doesn't put any stress on the liver or the kidneys or the bone marrow. Um, uh, you know, in terms of um, you know any more common um, descriptions of uh, changes that. Um, that we hear from from parents is that um, about 10% of children we know can have some change in their in their mood. They're a little bit more irritable or maybe kind of at a shorter fuse, if you will. That's the main thing. For clonopin, just very quickly, also by and large, um, very safe from the standpoint of other organs. It does tend to make you tired, which is why um, we try not to use it on a regular basis. It's used typically in cases of you know, sort of more emergency cases when somebody's seizures are popping up and getting worse because they're sick or something else is going on. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, Dr. Shaw, if you don't mind, maybe afterwards during our break to step out in the hall and take a couple more questions. Very I'm very right? happy to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I do. And I do want to speak to um, Ma'am to you specifically. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. We, uh, we're going to take a break for 15 minutes, um, and you can. Uh, if you wanted to ask your question now, we can. You want to take one more question right here? Is it like, here, here question? Okay. Um, you had just mentioned about how um, either not treating seizures or not getting good control with the first two medications makes the seizures more difficult to control. And I was just wondering if there's a known like pathophysiology behind that. That's a really good question. Um, so the, the either you can think about that as either is that happening because um, of the underlying cause of somebody's epilepsy, meaning that they are developing intractable epilepsy, or is there some component of something called pharmacoresistance, meaning is is there some reason why they're not their brain in particular isn't responding as we would want it to to the medicines and. That latter question in particular is something that has beguiled um, epileptologists and researchers for a very long time, and, and we don't fully understand why it is that um, some children's um, brains become can become resistant over time or don't respond um, as completely as we would want to medications um, in the first place. Um, we don't understand why that is. It could have something to do with an individual genetic makeup. That's one of the theories. That's something that we don't fully understand completely, though, in, in granular detail. Um, 
Um, we also do know that for certain um, underlying causes of epilepsy, we know that um, they are sort of strong enough or that they're severe enough that the tools that we have to try to suppress the seizures or kill the seizures are, are often um, you know, not able to do that 100%, despite our best efforts. So examples of that would be um, epilepsies like Gervais syndrome, which is particularly challenging epilepsy to control, or lennox gastro syndrome, for instance. Um, we know that it relates to just sort of the intrinsic or underlying changes that, that you know, a child has because of those um, illnesses. Um, that make the seizures particularly hard to control. So it's kind of one or the other. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. That was a great question. Thank you so much, Dr. Shaw, for your excellent presentation. And thanks, everyone, for your, your great questions, too. And again, Dr. Shaw will be available for a few more minutes if, uh, for people who had wanted to talk with her individually.